If you have ever wanted a mix between Total War and Paradox games in a deliciously deep and old school vibed package, Knights of Honor 2 might be the game you've always dreamt of. This is something of a revolution in non-Total War strategy games in a whole lot of ways, as it takes on the entirety of Europe and the Near East, while simultaneously allowing for surprisingly large-scale battles both on the field and in larger sieges. But what exactly is Knights of Honor 2? This medieval-themed strategy game that somehow has a predecessor, and is it even good? Remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and let's get right into this thing. Knights of Honor 2 is perhaps the most exciting strategy game this year, even when compared to the massive Victoria and Warhammer 3. And the reason is simple. It combines aspects of other games you love and tries to create a larger, more interactive whole. Here we choose our starting faction on the Grand Overlay map among a number of countries all around the world, and as you can tell, there are a whole lot of them here. There's even three different time periods you can start in, ranging from the 12th to the 14th century, meaning that each start date will provide various challenges and opportunities. I love that we have an actual overlay map here by the way, one that allows us to view the world in the colors of politics, relations, who has royal kids to royally marry off, and so on. Picking a faction opens up that beautiful main campaign map where everything happens. Here, the world is recreated in beautiful detail, from the cities to the marching armies, and one of my personal favorite aspects is the distinctiveness of it all. Here we have clear rivers making larger countries easier to navigate, and I absolutely love that the mountains of this world are so pronounced, as it makes those mountainous areas of the Alps, the Scottish Highlands, and Norway all the more unique. But okay, I had to gush about that for a second, but let's get into how this all works, because there is a lot to talk about here. Knights of Honor 2's campaign functions in real time, meaning there are no turns and everything happens second by second. Literally, there's a timer down in the corner telling you how long you've played the game for. In that way, this is kind of paradox-like. On the other, our cities and the way kingdom development and expansion works, it's much more like Total War. Cities and towns dot the map, and every one of them is part of a unique province. And listen now, because this is a shocker. I love the province system. I know, right? That's something you've never heard me say before. Well, before you think I'm an imposter and not the real Andy because I'm acting kinda sussy, let me explain. The provinces of Knights of Honor 2 have weight to them, and it all comes down to a variety of factors. Let's begin with the basics, the layout. Our provinces are made up of a capital city and surrounding towns. The city is where your main economic and military power lies. Here we can raise a number of buildings in various aspects of civilization, which are standard for everyone, such as barracks or markets, but depending on where in the world you are, you have access to different resources. Easiest to comprehend is that only coastal cities have access to ports, but even better is that strategic resources are scattered all over the world and are only found in certain places. This is important because certain buildings need specific resources to function, and owning them gives any kingdom a big advantage not only during construction, but also when trading with other states. I have to say that I absolutely love this building system. The UI artwork is nothing short of beautiful, featuring hand-drawn images that are in no way abstract, but shows exactly what it is they are representing. It makes everything feel so much more grounded, and I can't get enough of it. But these main buildings isn't the only thing going on here. Each building also has a number of improvements which are vital to pay attention to. For example, Farms can be upgraded to utilize crop rotation. The fun thing is that once you've upgraded your farms once, the upgrade is applied to every farm in your realm, meaning there's no tedious upgrading every single one. Now the danger here is of course that by doing so, it might take away from the experience of having certain farms be better and more developed than others, if everyone gets the same thing everywhere. But this is not the case. First of all, the main building is of course the most important one, and upgrading that will differentiate one farming sector from another. But most importantly, is the other aspect of development in Knights of Honor 2, namely towns. My favorite aspect of Knights of Honor 2 is the scale of and design of provinces, and the developers have absolutely nailed it. The towns are smaller, specialized hotspots dotting the map, and every province capital is linked to more or less of these depending on the province. These towns can be either villages, monasteries, castles, or a number of other types of farms and resource towns. This is what makes every province unique, and if one province has more farms than another, for example, it will exponentially increase the resource gain from a capital city farm building. What's so lovely about this system is that it reminds me of the province system in total wars like Empire and Shogun 2, where you also had a main city and resources scattered around. But the difference here 
And what makes this whole thing just so perfect? is that Knights of Honor 2 has actually put effort into making even these smaller towns so unique. Not just in terms of economic aspects, but also military ones. Let me put it this way. Towns, just like in Empire Total War, can be raided and looted. But the difference is that you actually have to invest time, effort, and manpower to take them. A castle town, for example, has walls and a garrison, and it's virtually like taking small cities. The castles need to be sieged to be won, and your army and siege power will determine how long it takes. A non-castle, however, does not have to be besieged, but you still have to invest some time into raiding it, looting it for its riches, be it mostly supplies or gold depending on the town. During this time, an enemy army may just come and stop you before you've managed to loot anything, meaning you can't just hit and run as easily and arbitrarily without potential consequences. Once looted, a town will remain unproductive for a time until it gets back up on its feet. It's very convenient that this happens automatically, as it kind of simulates the people of our towns getting back to normal life after enough time has passed. This entire province system is just absolutely fantastic, and because of how everything comes together so well, from the UI art, to the way the towns actually have weight and importance, and additionally to how, despite having a max of 8 unlockable building slots, customizing your cities based on the towns around it feels so immersive and fun, this just might be my favorite province system in any strategy game ever. What's even greater about Knights of Honor 2 is the simple yet deep way our armies function. Every city has an inherent militia that are levied during sieges, but to actually wage war yourself, you need armies, and an army need commander, or a marshal as the game calls them. Marshals are part of your knights in the royal court, and along with your ruler, can be called to war. This makes them actual physical beings on the map. They begin only with their own knightly retinue, but place them in a city, and you can recruit units. Which units you can recruit are based on the presence of and level of barracks you have there, meaning it's important to pay attention to which city you place your army in when recruiting. Each army has a max unit slot of 8 units, and this cannot be expanded. What can be increased, however, is the army's manpower. The lower the manpower, the less units you have per unit and vice versa. This means that a late game army with added modifiers from the kingdom and the army leader might be vastly superior in size than the one from the early game. Units can also increase in rank after battles and become more elite. This means that the units determine which type of soldier you recruit, while the manpower determines that unit's amount of soldiers. Additionally, armies have special units and modifiers they can add, again depending on what's available in the city. After a few upgrades, it's possible to build siege works, and if your marshal has a siege craft skill, they can add catapults or trebuchets, which makes sieging much easier. Be aware, however, that developer Blacksea Games are actual geniuses and have decided to implement amazing mechanics even here. The act of sieging a walled city or castle in the Middle Ages was a massive undertaking, requiring a large effort on part of the besieging forces. Therefore, armies in Knights of Honor 2 not only have a supply modifier which depletes over time as long as you are outside home territories, but which can be increased with one of those special slots. Sieging a city requires a force that has the morale and the manpower for prolonged sieges, as these things take a long time actually, no matter whether you're sieging a castle town or a city. The most important feature here might be that you can't just rush siege a city. Like we established, sieging takes time, but mainly because of one modifier. The fact that you cannot assault a city before its defenses have been crippled to 50%. I was a bit skeptical at first, feeling like I wasn't making much progress or that things took too long. But then I realized, you know what? This is actually exactly what I've been missing. In other games, it feels like sieging is either a chore, like in Crusader Kings or EU4 without just having to wait around, or in Total War, where sieging down a city is mainly down to attrition the defending army. But here, you're actually forced to siege because sieging is hard, especially if the enemy has outside forces. This means that it's possible for the enemy to attack your sieging army, and lift the siege that way, forcing a battle. Importantly, when an army besieges a city or castle, but then decides to lift the siege on their own accord, they suffer a large morale decrease, possibly making fighting future battles that much harder. In this way, it's vital for the player to first pay attention to enemy armies and which cities, castles, or towns are worth sieging or raiding in the first place, and second, to come prepared for war. When I tell you that the AI in this game is actually good, I'm not joking and it's good at both amassing armies and sending them overseas. It's therefore vital to recruit the right units and have at least a semi-diverse force, and knowing the strength of your units. Norway, for example, can recruit a unique Viking unit, and although they have very light armor, 
They have amazing attack values. This makes them a great shock infantry unit, but perhaps not want to hold your front line against an incoming cavalry charge. This leads us to the battles, and this is where Knights of Honor 2 really manages to do something special. As one of the only strategy series out there, this game combines a grand campaign with field battles, both of them in real time. What we have here are essentially a mix between Age of Empires and Total War battles, in that the unit sizes are those of Total War, along with the way they're used, moved, and positioned, but they're also controlled from above. While I won't suggest they're as epic as those in Total War, they're absolutely a massive step up from the likes of Age of Empires in terms of sheer size and amount of epic. Whether a small battle with just a few units, or a larger one with sieging a city, I found that numbers are not the only thing that determines the outcome of battles, as both quality of the generals, troops, and importantly, the tactics are extremely important. Obviously, there will be times when tactics just won't do it for you. Say if your generals are newbies and the enemies are masterminds, but honestly, and especially if the forces are relatively even, tactics will mean everything. I'm also surprised at how epic this actually looks. The fact that we have a real-time campaign and real-time battles just baffles and continues to impress me. Just like in Total War games, I don't necessarily fight them all, but the ones that matter or the ones I find particularly cool, I do. And that makes the entire difference, really. The opportunity, the sheer ability to fight these battles out yourself. It's a bonus that they're so fun to play as well, and I again especially enjoy the use of tactics and position to carry the day. What I find a bit less fun about the battles are the inclusion of several win modifiers. It's possible to win depending on various factors. The first is winning outright by routing the entire enemy army, and that's fine enough, of course. You can also win a battle simply by killing all of the enemy commanders, or, and this is the worst offender, by capturing certain points on the map. And this goes for every map, by the way, even field battles. This gives me flashbacks to those awful capture points in Rome 2, and I found that the enemy sometimes rushes the capture point if they can. It seems a bit like an arbitrary way to win a battle to me, and even though I can live with killing the generals part, the capture points is a step too far in my book. What would have made the battles go from good to perfection, however, would be the inclusion of more unique unit models and more zoom options. Right now, the zoom is not flexible at all really, not allowing me to zoom as close in or as high up as I'd like to. I can tell that the units are nicely modeled, but I want to see more, and I also want to get a better overview of the battlefield for a much needed tactical boost. I hope this is something the devs will look into, and the zoom options especially are desperately needed. Back on the campaign map, there is a whole lot more going on than just warfare. But even for warfare, you need to spice up the Royal Court. The Royal Court is your gateway to the majority of interesting events in the game, and is what really allows you to influence the goings-on both within and outside your kingdom. There are eight different knights to recruit beside your inherent king, ranging from the humble spy, the conniving merchant, the cleric, to the diplomat and of course the marshal. All of these are powerful agents with various abilities, and using them correctly is the key to victory. For example, while I was besieging a city in Ireland and facing a long war, my spy, who had already infiltrated the enemy, managed to open the gates to the castle. This meant I could launch a battle instantly. Similarly, while trade agreements with other countries opens up the ability to trade, merchants are what actually facilitates most of it. Merchants can be placed abroad to create trade networks, not only netting you more gold income, but also allows you to import resources. Agents are also vitally important since they act as governors of cities, another modifier which, depending on their skills, massively influences a province's income in one of our various mana points. That's right, Knights of Honor 2 has to collect various powers to facilitate good governance, including gold, books, commerce, piety, and kingdom levies, all with different uses. Books are used to level up characters with new knowledge, while piety can be used to choose a new heir for your kingdom. We also have commerce, which is vital to maintain trade routes for foreign kingdoms, and kingdom levies determine if you can even recruit new units. For now, some appear much more important than others. I personally find very little use for piety except for certain cleric abilities while playing as Norway, for example. But clerics also function as cultural missionaries, and may bring foreign nationals into your own. This makes clerics and piety much more important if you're a big conqueror or running a multi-ethnic empire. But I wish there was a bit more here. On the other hand, I find I absolutely have to pay attention to commerce no matter who I play as. My problem is that I sometimes, and quite often, don't find the UI explanations as intuitive or easy to find as they should be. That's another thing about this game, by the way. While the foundations are absolutely solid, and once you really learn things it feels better and better, Knights of Honor 2 is sadly not good at informing the player of a whole lot of things. 
Don't get me wrong, this game has absolutely taken a page out of the book of Crusader Kings 3 in terms of tooltips and information, allowing us to mostly get quick overviews of most things, or if we need more help, to consult the Royal Library for in-depth information. But that's just the thing. I find that there are so many things I need more in-depth information on, or stuff that is explained poorly. For example, simply hovering over a knight's skills does not tell me what they actually mean. Additionally, during events, it's sometimes hard to figure out what the outcomes will lead to other than some vague statement, because the game often doesn't like to explain the details. Army movement is extremely important in this game, reminding me of how it works in Mountain Blade Bannerlord, but we have no way of telling how quickly armies actually move. There's also little explanation for what happiness is versus what stability is in a province, on what basis other countries like or dislike you a certain amount of points, and even though there is a Pope mechanic in this game, all of its mechanics are hidden in the Royal Library. And since there is no search function which would have helped immensely, digging through it to find what you're looking for can be hard, especially if you don't know what you're looking for in the first place. One thing I found that just kind of happened to me was the Crusade. Sire, we've received a letter from the Pope. We've improved our opinion with the clergy. For Christ and glory, a new crusade is coming. My troops are waiting. I was happily asked by the Pope to lead a crusade on Jerusalem itself, and accepted. But as I did, my king was taken from me, now controlled by a crusading army led by the AI. On the journey, the crusading army can choose to attack other cities as well, spawning either new kingdoms or giving it to the crusading army's faction. But these are decisions that's completely out of the player's hands. What baffles me further is that once Jerusalem was taken, it was turned into its own kingdom, Palestine, led by what looked like a Saracen ruler. All the while, the kingdom of Jerusalem still existed all around it. This especially is an area where I feel player agency and control must be given back, especially in terms of what happens once the crusading army takes cities. Even on the battlefields, I'm having a hard time intuitively understanding things like moral gain and loss. We have several bars all around here, and while a health bar is easy enough, the morale is split into two colors with varying modifiers, and it's hard to immediately understand what they actually represent. There are a ton of other such examples I've encountered while playing the game, and I think the moral of the story is that in a complex strategy game with a lot of mechanics, it's much better to give as much information as possible in the easiest way possible, because if not, the player might feel confused or that they're not doing what they're supposed to and that ruins immersion more than any amount of detailed information ever will. There's even more to the governing of the game's kingdoms though, as we have the various classes and the stability of the kingdom to maintain. Here, the various classes, corresponding mostly with our knights in the royal court, approve or disapprove of our actions, which in turn modifies the contributions to the kingdom. An overall stability meter influences each province in the realm for better or worse, and a crown authority mechanic further allows us to increase things like tax income. All of these mechanics work excellently, and I really enjoy how my actions influence the class's outlook on me. What I do miss though, is a heads up for this, because often, actions will suddenly lead to the changing of moods. Even though it's not explained easily, going to war may for example lower the opinion of the peasants and the merchants, while raising the opinion of the army. It might sound intuitive, but in the heat of the moment, and especially for those used to every outcome being explained in detail for the best informed decisions in Paradox games, this is admittedly quite jarring at times. Don't think we're done just yet though, as we of course have diplomacy to talk about. Even though we have dedicated diplomatic agents in the game, it's actually possible to conduct diplomacy whenever we want. Diplomacy is vitally important as it not only allows you to conduct trade, sign defensive and offensive agreements, but also because it governs the likes of war and royal marriages. That's right, royal marriages is a thing in Ice of Honor 2, and a separate menu even allows you to see your family and who they're married to. Royal marriages tie countries closer together and even allows for the inheritance of provinces after a ruler's death, although this is not always the case. Diplomacy isn't the deepest part of Knights of Honor 2, but it does the job well enough for it not to bother me. It's definitely deeper than the likes of civilization and kind of on par with the depth of most of the war games I'd say, but again there's a massive lack of information here. We have essentially no indicators as to why or why not people will agree to proposals. The only thing we can go by really is how much they like you but it's rarely a surefire way to tell if they'll agree to something more than trade rights or non-aggression pacts. This ties somewhat into the design choice of Black Sea games, meaning the less possible information the better, and the ethos of the sandbox experience. What I mean by this is that even though we have start dates in Knights of Honor 2, we have no in-game dates. We only have that little timer. 
but no years actually go by. Characters age by stage only, as in juvenile, adult, and old. But there are no years to tell me when someone might die, for example. There's further no historical events or anything of the sort, with some of the only actual grand events being regularly called crusades and jihads. Indeed, even though there is a script that favors certain regions for specific resources, each new game randomizes the appearance of resources every time, meaning there's no historical or real-world pointers to go by, i.e. there always being a lot of farms and food produced in Egypt or Ukraine, for example. These values are moddable, though, so hopefully a more historical approach to resources and other things will be added in by modders soon. I do think a historical versus randomized approach would have been nice to have as campaign launch option, however, as they've already set a precedence for that with other factors. There is just so much to say about Knights of Honor 2, from the fact that it's gorgeous and with beautifully composed music, to occasionally presenting menus with a charming presenter and with characters actually having voice acted lines, to the depth of the campaign, and of course the combination of this large and deep world with a battle map that is actually a lot of fun to play. Knights of Honor 2 is not perfect. It took me quite a few hours to get into the flow of things, and that's of course how you know you're playing a great strategy game. But it would have been much easier if the UI had offered me more information, better tooltips, and more at a glance help. I also think the experience can seem to lack a sense of direction. This is of course intended as this is at the heart of a sandbox experience, but personally, I believe things like national missions in games like EU4 only enhances my immersion, and I would love to see something similar here as well. And if we could get better zoom in and out options for the campaign map as well, that would make me very happy. Knights of Honor 2 is something especially unique, I feel, because it actually feels like an old school strategy game come to life in a new age. The stylized menus especially makes me feel this way, and even though I would have liked a much bigger range in faces for the characters, it's virtually flawless and so immersive, really focusing on what makes UI for PC so great and unique. I have to admit I'm very impressed by the foundations and the general design of this game, as it really feels like it oozes passion and commitment. It's certainly not free of issues, and I would love to see the devs flesh this game out even more with small and larger expansions. But what's here is something that will offer you hundreds of hours of gameplay in a world which is so much fun to develop, explore, and expand in. And as a lover of amazing strategy games, Knights of Honor 2 might be the most charming and immersive strategy game of 2022 in a year when both Total War Warhammer 3 and Victoria 3 released as well. And if nothing else, that is a massive vote of confidence from me, and I highly recommend checking this out if you're hungry for a medieval empire builder like no other. I know I've been starving. Cheers.